said, we have made our way through the two accounts of creation, the murder of Abel, and have seen the spiritual degeneration of humankind, which brought on the flood. Our fair today is the story of the Tower of Babel, a story with so many nuances that I want you to know the proposition at the very beginning, if for no other reason than to assure you that there is a destination in what follows, despite the twists and turns our path will take. Whatever its original intent, the church, you may be surprised to know, has come to see itself in the Tower of Babel with this result. A church that has insulated, isolated, and homogenous is not the body of Christ, whose mission was to those outside the camp where he preached good news to the poor and released to the captives, taught by word and deed, healed the sick, bound up the brokenhearted, ate with outcasts, forgave sinners, and called all to repent and believe in the gospel. First then, a bit about the story in its context. In the literature of the ancient Near East, there are creation stories, tales about sibling rivalry leading to fratricide, and accounts of a great flood. But there is nothing else which closely resembles the Tower of Babel. At its most superficial level, the story is surely etiological. Why are there so many different nationalities and languages, someone wondered and then conceived a story which, to his satisfaction at least, answered the question. Now, etiological is likely a word you've not used today. It's a wonderful word, E-T-I-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L, -O -O -I -I and it simply means having to do with cause or origin. If you want to explain something, you tell a story that, to your satisfaction, explains it. The story may have also been told to explain the actual ruins of an ancient tower, which was almost certainly a ziggurat, the name given to the sacred towers integral to the religion of Mesopotamia. They were huge structures consisting of several layers, the size of each being less than the one below it. Staircases were attached to the sides, and at the apex, there was a shrine to some god or another. Now, such as that may explain the story's origin, but of greater concern to us is the use to which the biblical writers put it. And here is the insight of one of those authorities on Genesis. The sins of Adam and Eve, Cain, Lamech, the angel marriages, the Tower of Babel, these are stages along that way which has separated humankind farther and farther from God. The succession of narratives points out a continually widening chasm between humankind and God, but God reacts to these outbreaks of human sin with severe judgments. The punishment of Adam and Eve was severe. Severer still was Cain's punishment. Then followed the flood, and the final judgment was the dispersion and the dissolution of unity of humankind. In a word, the harmony of Eden has become the cacophony of Babel. And the people said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Overstepping our human limitations is the point of the story as it has been understood through the centuries 
of biblical interpretation. Just as Adam and Eve overstepped our human limitations when they deliberately entered the forbidden zone in the garden, just as Cain overstepped them when he murdered Abel, thus presuming upon God's sovereignty over all life, and just as Lamech overstepped them when he sought to avenge an insult. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And somewhere in that series of episodes, the discerning can surely begin to recognize themselves and the societies we live in. More particularly, some have seen in this text an agrarian's polemic against urban culture. And there may well be some of that, for which reason, lo, these centuries later, you and I choose to live in the suburbs. Although the Bible nowhere impugns cities, indeed, heaven itself is most vividly pictured as a celestial city. Nevertheless, there is the recognition throughout Scripture that sinfulness and its potential for disaster go hand in hand with human culture and technological progress. At the depth of it, however, the criticism is not of cities or culture or progress, but rather of motive. Let us make a name for ourselves. There's the heart of it, the pride and arrogance and persistent quest for self-sufficiency on the part of those who were created to trust ultimately in God alone. And so the city arises as a sign of the people's self-reliance and the tower as a sign of their will to fame. The story tells of our autonomous attempt to secure the future by our own efforts, someone wrote. And another put it this way, Babel introduces a universal theme and a new alien note is struck in God's creation. Now humankind proposes to be their own master. Finally, they become so obsessed by their ability and technological omnipotence that they conclude they can make anything and do everything. But for all the criticism, I can understand that, can't you? We're told that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, but who wouldn't rather know for a fact than merely to hope for, to see with my very own eyes than to trust in promises for the fulfillment of which there seems to be so little compelling evidence. As the city expands and the tower rises, the uneasy fear that this experiment could be dangerous subsides. They are clearly getting away with it. And the absence of any thunderbolt of judgment proves that they are, after all, masters of the universe. Until one day, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. Now this is nothing other than delightful satire. God must come down, not because he is nearsighted, but because from the tremendous height of his perspective, the city and the tower are so minuscule. Helmut Thielicke said this in a sermon, something like a touch of humor breaks out for the first time in this old Bible. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower. Do we catch the laughter of God between the lines? The point is that as mighty and significant as the builders think it to be, 
it is so minuscule from God's point of view that he can't see it clearly. Such irony. The builders thought the structure so colossal that it would surely take God's breath away, dispossess him of his place in heaven. Yet from God's perspective, it looks like something built by brownies, goblins, or Lilliputians, so tiny and microscopically small that it cannot be seen without glasses and a telescope. He who sits in the heavens laughs, the psalmist wrote, the Lord has them in derision. They feared being scattered abroad and thought that by building the city and the tower, they could secure the future they preferred. But the punishment for their presumption fit the crime. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth. Therefore the city was called Babel, maybe Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. B. Davy Napier, a very insightful commentator, sums it up this way. We presume to effect our own security. We put our trust in our own efforts as if God did not exist. The judgment under which we all live and from which we all suffer is division, misunderstanding, and antagonism. The multiple and tragic divisions within the human family result from pride and arrogance, self-trust and self-worship. The resolution by unmistakable implication lies only in our acceptance of the status of creature, of faith in our God. Well, now there you have the typical time-honored interpretation of this story, overstepping our human limitations. There's no little truth in that understanding, truth about each one of us and about all culture and human society. But there's another way of looking at the story which might be captioned understepping our Christian obligations. The city and tower are most certainly symbols of human pride and self-reliance. There's no mistaking that. But there's also something more than that. And here's the key to it. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. We can appropriately enlarge upon that a bit. Not only did they speak the same language, but they had the same words. Another way of saying that they understood one another perfectly, using the same cliches, sharing the same shibboleths, enjoying the same prejudices and points of view. More than that, they probably dressed alike and had similar values. To the very core of their being, they were homogenous and had every intention of remaining homogenous. Babel was their ghetto against the introduction of anything foreign to their way of life. And that is why what they feared the most was to be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. But to be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth is precisely God's intentions for humankind. There is the obligation they sought to avoid. Do you remember God's charge to Adam and Eve as the sun set on the sixth day of creation? God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. The surprise is this. God wills diversity rather than the only unity we are capable of effecting. One thoroughly insulated against everything and everyone perceived to be different and alien 
to our values and points of view. Understandably, there is safety in homogeneity, but it is a safety God will not tolerate. Listen to Terry Fretheim in his commentary. The building project constitutes a bid to secure their own future as a unified community isolated from the rest of the world. Thus this action constitutes a challenge to the divine command to fill the earth. It is only by spreading abroad that humans can fulfill their charge to be caretakers of the earth. An isolated view of their place in the world centered on self-preservation puts the rest of creation at risk. The building project thus understeps rather than oversteps human limits. Any unity which seeks self-preservation at all costs, which resists rather than welcomes the stranger, thereby closing itself off from the serendipities of God, must be resisted. And so the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth, an act which within the context of the story is perceived to be judgment and punishment, but which within the larger context is properly understood as God's determination to fulfill his intentions for creation. Typically, God's judgment always has a gracious purpose. He confused their language, forcing them to move apart from one another, but this confusing, which leads to scattering, thus becomes the means to the end of fulfilling and caring for the earth. Therefore, God promotes diversity at the expense of any form of unity that seeks to preserve itself in isolation from the rest of creation. Now we should not hear in any of this unity within the human family is of no consequence to God. It is rather of the greatest consequence. But that unity based upon self-preservation is nothing God will honor and is certain to destroy. The only unity which is capable of transcending every diversity is an acknowledgement of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, whose mission was to those outside the camp, as the writer to the Hebrews put it, where he preached good news to the poor and released to the captives, taught by word and deed, heal the sick, bound up the brokenhearted, ate with outcasts, forgave sinners, and called everyone to repent and believe the gospel. When Jesus asked the disciples who they thought he was, and Peter replied with a flash of insight, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, then Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now that is a defining text for the mission and purpose of the church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against them. More often than not, however, the way in fact we hear that text is deeply revealing, as if it said that hell would not prevail against the gates of the church, as if the church's primary obligation was to insulate its purity and piety against an alien invasion from without. But the text plainly tells us just the opposite. The church 
is to be on the offensive in the world, never the defensive, storming the gates of hell, which can never finally prevail against the relentless force of the gospel. And so the Confession of 1967 affirms this, God's redeeming work in Jesus Christ embraces the whole of human life, social and cultural, economic and political, scientific and technological, individual and corporate. It includes our natural environment as exploited and despoiled by sin. It is the will of God that his purpose for human life shall be fulfilled under the rule of Christ and all evil be banished from his creation. And then there is this. We should recognize in the citizens of Babel the church's astonishing refusal to heed the Great Commission. As Matthew tells it, these are Jesus' last words to his disciples. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And yet the reality of it is that most of us are reluctant so much as to invite a friend to church or speak to the stranger in our midst. The reason, I submit, goes deeper than social reticence to an uncertainty about the uniqueness and finality of Jesus Christ. If with this age of religious pluralism and broad-minded tolerance, you believe that one God is as good as any other, that evangelism is not a functioning word in your vocabulary. But if with Peter, you know it in your own heart to be true, that there is salvation in no one else than Jesus Christ, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved, then you understand evangelism by word and deed to be your most cherished opportunity and compelling obligation. A church that is insulated, isolated, and homogenous is not the body of Christ because Jesus suffered outside the city gate in order to sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp and bear the abuse he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Our Lord's own ministry was outside the city gate, preaching, preaching good news to the poor and release to those held captive on the margin of society, healing the sick, binding up the brokenhearted, offending every social convention by eating with outcasts, outraging the homogenous religious establishment by forgiving sinners, and offering the gospel to everyone who acknowledged the need of it, whatever their looks or their language. And where Jesus is, there his church must always be, till glorious from thy heaven above shall come the city of our God. And there you have the Tower of Babel.
I'll bet you never thought it would take that turn, did you? Well, Jack, you are the king of the surprise turn. <laughs> well, it's an incredible story with tremendous implications for us. It seems to me, Jack, that the evangelic church in many ways is the, um, the Pharisees of today. We are supposed to evangelize, but our own pride gets in the way and we, we judge those others, those others. They're not like us. And we're doing the very same thing as building the Tower of Babel. I think that's a keen insight. But what worries me, Bob, is that if we do not believe in the uniqueness and finality of Jesus Christ, then evangelism is just not in our vocabulary. It's very difficult to evangelize somebody if you don't believe in the uniqueness and finality of Christ. Absolutely. How do you deal with doctrinal differences, or differences of opinion on, on matters that are deeply spiritual? You love, you love. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a presentation coming up very soon that is called Affirming the Faith of Those Who Have No Faith. And there we will get into the very thing that you just raised. Uh, how do you deal with, with those who uh, don't believe as we do or believe anything at all? Jack, do you think, yeah, I think about this a lot as a progressive pastor, um, you know, and as a, a relatively progressive Christian, uh, you know, I feel like there's a tension of values that a lot of Christians face this, you know, right now where I was raised in a, in a context that taught me that everybody's truth is valuable and has value. And, and I don't disagree with that, but I think that perhaps that that can be part of where this tension comes in of we have this, this claim in our faith, right? That we hold a sacred and as a unique truth that has given us life. And on the other hand, uh, many of us are sort of steep deeply in a culture that tells us that we need to respect other people's truth mm -hmm. and those two really just hit into each other in a way that i think can be really tricky especially when people don't feel like they have a, a strong grounding in the church to make sense of those two things um i feel like and you know i i wasn't alive for the 60s and 70s so i can't say what the church was like from the inside but when i read about the ways that um, church historians talk about like formation during that time and how the church responded in certain moments to to what was happening in the world around them. It makes me wonder whether there was just a collective lack of voice um, that didn't really help people articulate and, and make sense of the world around them in conversation with their faith. I, I see the church in some ways scrambling to fix that now uh, and doing it half well. <laughs> I think at best half well. Uh, I don't think anybody, certainly I, have no patience with grabbing somebody by the collar and saying, are you saved, brother or sister? You just, you can't do that. First place, that's not a very effective way to get them saved if they aren't. But uh, the, uh, the thing that I'm talking about, I think, can best be described uh, in an event that happened in the Philadelphia Presbytery meeting some years ago in which there was a report from a fellow named Herb Lanks who was head of a group endorsed by the Presbytery called uh, maybe Messiah for Jesus 
uh, or Jews for Jesus, whatever. Oh, Herb I had to go there. <laughs> well, Herb was a Jew, and uh, and yet a Christian was a classmate of mine at Princeton Seminary. He made a report uh, as he was requested to do by the Presbytery, and up on her feet jumped a prominent pastor in this presbytery who tore into him, laced him upside and down, and complained to the presbytery about giving money to such an organization that would have the temerity and the rudeness and the embarrassment to try and convert the Jews. I can remember that. Huh? I remember that. Yeah. There's uh, elitism. There's elitism on both sides of the fence. Very conservative, well, very liberal, and they both think they're right, and they look down at each other, and there's very little, in, very little done to come into the middle. Yeah. What happens to the Great Commission? I mean, you, obviously there are ways of evangelizing and ways of not evangelizing, but if we are afraid to talk about our faith, even to others who share our faith, let alone those who don't, then I think we have abandoned any claim to be a part of the church's appropriate mission. Yeah, I think I, what I can say from, no, I wasn't there when that happened. I know you were. Um, I think that's a good example, as you described it at least, of a situation where you have the potential for understanding but people are so deeply entrenched in how they think they need to be that they're unwilling to under entertain the possibility that there might be a way that is not their way. And, you know, in terms of like, I think sometimes we think we're not allowed to do certain things. Like we're not allowed to talk about our faith in certain kinds of groups. So we're not allowed to tell somebody we think that they might really find something meaningful in church because we worry that we might offend their sensibilities. I mean, I know for myself, I'm a pastor, like it's my job and it still feels weird to talk to people, uh, to cold call, if you want to call that um, what it is, but there is a possibility of what does it mean to be invitational? Um, to what does it mean to, to ask someone to consider, you know, that this might be a place of life for them. Because I mean, I don't see anybody sitting at church being like, man, what drudgery. Um, you know, they're there because they found something positive and meaningful in community and in Christ. All true. But again, every study that is done about church growth says people come to church because somebody invited them. Yes. Now let me tell you another story that David Watermotor told me. Oh, yeah about two men who were chemists, worked in the same lab, and uh, were together day after day for years before they discovered that they both belonged to the Bryn Mawr Presbyterian Church. They both lived, they shared a driveway. One house was behind the other. One family went to the 930 service, one went to the 11 o'clock service, and it was years before these guys standing elbow to elbow at the Bunsen burner discovered that they were both Christians and they both belonged to the Bryn Mawr Presbyterian Church. That's also an outgrowth of the very private mainline culture that we have. Well, but it, that could be the case in Andrews, Texas, where I grew up. So, I've always enjoyed personally that uh, when I welcome people into membership in a church I serve, I've always told them they have a choice. They can either have a baby or invite a friend. Well, <laughs> I think I would bet you that some of them would say having a baby is my choice. <laughs> rather, it's an option. Rather, rather than inviting a friend. <laughs> um, we could go on and on about this. I realize that I, what I propose to you is not uh, in vogue, let's say. But there's one more thing I would like to do before we call it quits. And that is, since we're leaving now, uh, the first major division of Genesis 1 through 11 and the stories we've been talking about, 
and about to begin the Abraham saga uh, that will take us for the next 39 chapters, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Uh, we spent a long time with Abraham because he was the progenitor of our faith in many ways. You know, we speak of Pentecost as being the birth of the church. But I suggest to you, and we can talk about this later on, that uh, the call of Abraham is the birth of the church. The church is God's chosen people. And our progenitor, Israel, was the first of those. But in any event, we'll get to that in due course. Here's what we have said for the last four or five weeks that there are multiple authors at work in these stories known in some quarters as JEDP, J being the writer who used Yahweh for God and dated from probably around 950 BC. E is the author who used Elohim for God, writing around 850. D is the Deuteronomist, reflecting the teaching of Deuteronomy. And P is a priestly group of editors who worked around 587 BC and sometime in that century put all these stories together into an anthology called the Pentateuch. Now, there were two distinctive accounts of creation of the universe we talked about, each telling exactly the same story, although in irreconcilably different ways, little concerned about the how of creation, but rather the who and the why. God created in order to have a relationship with what he created, especially human beings. And that is the story they both tell. We've said that many of these stories in chapters 1 through 11, as I just said a while ago, are etiological, stories told to explain cause or origin. If after reading the Inquirer on any given morning, you said to yourself, how did things ever get to be this way? Which is exactly what the mayor and the police commissioner are asking as we speak. You could either write a theological treatise or you could tell a story. That story might be about someone you decided to name Adam and Eve, who committed the primal sin when they said to God, thank you very much, but we prefer to live on our own terms rather than on yours. And that's called idolatry. And it threw out of joint not only our relationship with God, but our relationships with each other and with nature. The second story that we talked about, Cain and Abel, introduces wanton violence within the human community. And the third story, Noah and the Flood, show the rampant increase of sin and rebellion, the perversion of human will against the divine will takes the form of moral depravity. I heard from several of you this week, which delights me no end, and two of you raised questions about Noah and the flood. And uh, let me tell you what they asked and what I said to them, because you may have a similar question. One said, in passing, you said, uh, last week, whether or not we take the narrative literally, the Noah story is troubling, and that maybe God should have run a red pencil through chapters 6 through 9 of Genesis. Could you say more? Well, here's the more that I said. My suggestion that God should have perhaps edited out 6 through 9 is not flippant, and here are some of the reasons why. The sheer horror of the event, if one takes it as historical, men, women, children, animals, all losing their desperate battle to keep their heads above 
the relentlessly rising water. That is a thoroughly repugnant picture to many, which raises in a roundabout way, this is very odd, I thought, the question of theodicy. How does one defend the goodness of God in the face of what appears to many to be an evil act of his own devising? Then there is the matter of quite a number of similar, some more similar than others, flood stories found in the writings of other ancient Near East civilizations, the most widely known being the Gilgamesh epic, G-I-L-G-A-M-E-S-H. In particular, this leads most biblical scholars to question the historicity of Israel's flood story. Now, this is not to say that there is not a significant intentionality in this story, as in the other Genesis 1 through 11 stories. This is Brueggemann's take, the essential fraction, fracture between creator and creation is the premise and agenda of the flood narrative. The story is not concerned with historical data but rather with strange things which happen in the heart of God that decisively affect God's creation. And another wanted to know, given the other civilization flood myths, do you, do I think some of the Noah story is factual? And here's what I said. I do not believe the story of Noah and the flood is in any way factual. Back to Brueggemann. The story is not concerned with historical data, but with strange things which happen in the heart of God that decisively affect God's creation. But this emphatically does not mean that the story is without merit or significance, but rather just like the other stories in Genesis 1 through 11, the flood story is part of a sermon about the grace and forgiveness of God. So now, if any of you has a lingering concern about Noah and the flood, now's your time to make it known forever after. Hold your peace. Are you okay with all that, or have you just thrown in the towel and given up. Have they discovered the ark? Uh, well, no, apparently not. There have <laughs> been several trips up Mount Ararat trying to find it, but I don't think they discovered it. Mm -hmm. Somebody built it recently locally here in the States. <laughs> Say that again, I didn't get it. Somebody built a replica here in the States of this. Oh, yeah. It's become right. quite the shrine. It was one big boat. Yeah. All right. So I so, wanted to mention a book. I don't know what you all are seeing. Is that backwards to you or frontwards? The title of this book. I'm just saying it's good. I the can see if we could read God. it. This is a book that Jay Wilkins recommended to us years ago when he was here. And I was just looking at what he said about Noah, and he, I, I, I get the idea that what he's saying is, here we see another example of how in the ancient world there were, there were prominent stories or prominent myths or prominent events, and different cultures interpreted them different ways. And the Gilgamesh myth I, I haven't read it, so I don't know, but I, um, this author says the way they tell it, it's about humans striving for power. And the way our Bible tells it, it's God coming around to a new covenant with his creation. So it seems it, it kind of like the, the, the creation stories where um, the Gilgam or the Babylonian stories don't give you a whole lot of hope <laughs> but we're given a story that says no god did it 
and loved it and wanted a relationship with what he created. Well, anything that Jay has to say on such matters would certainly be worth understanding for two reasons. One, he's got a PhD in religion and science. And secondly, he was one of my students at Austin Seminary. <laughs> okay. All righty. Well, it's not his book. I mean, he didn't write the book. He just recommended it. Oh, Arnold well, Rhodes. Right. Yeah. Jay's a good oh, you fellow. probably told him to read this book, huh? Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> right. All okay. right. I mush on. Uh, human sinfulness and rebellion against God, whether in the form of disobedience, violence, depravity, or apostasy, is always divinely judged and punished. But it is very important to observe that divine judgment, severe as it is, is never without the quality of divine mercy. Look, the humans are expelled from the garden, but their lives continue with every indication of divine concern. Cain is expelled from his own community, yet he is granted divine protection. In the flood, humankind is destroyed, but not quite, and there comes the rainbow. God's own reminder of the day God changed his mind. The Tower of Babel results in the disbursement of humankind and division which leads to fundamental misunderstandings. Yet again, life is continued in the divine hope that we will come to know the one source of unity and peace. The divine judgment is never merely punitive in character. It is ultimately redemptive in purpose. So in these first 11 chapters, we've encountered two very important concepts, especially important because they tie the two testaments together. First, the imago dei. The image of God has nothing to do with our appearance but rather the distinctive capacity of the human to understand truth, to create what is beautiful, to know and to do what is right. Something of the very essence of the creator is revealed when we exercise our freedom to be obedient to God and faithful to one another, responsible and gracious to the flora and fauna which have been entrusted to our care. The imago in Adam and Eve was not totally destroyed, but their idolatry so horribly defaced the image that it was scarcely possible for God to recognize himself in us until <clears throat> in the form of Jesus Christ, there came what Paul called the second Adam. <clears throat> he emptied himself of divinity, while Adam and Eve and the children of Seth attempted to seize divinity. The one denied himself, while the others exalted themselves. The one gave his life for others, while the others not only got mad, they got even. Now, the second concept is covenant. We first encounter the word describing the unique relationship which God agrees to enter into with creation at the conclusion of the flood story when God says that he will never again destroy all creation. And as a reminder to himself, I think that's as clever as anything you're going to find anywhere in the Bible. As a reminder to himself, God causes a rainbow to grace the sky. The covenant then becomes more specific in God's promise to Abraham that his descendants shall inherit the land God is prepared to give them. And that occurs in a very strange and smelly ritual described in Genesis 15. At Sinai, 
God makes clear that in order to enjoy the benefits of this covenantal relationship, there are certain things expected of the people. The Ten Commandments, we call them, the law. Throughout the remainder of Israel's history, the people tried, more or less, to keep the law, but largely failed, often with disastrous results. And then along came Jeremiah, who dreamed of a new covenant written not on parchment or stone, but on the heart. And we next hear about that covenant of the heart when Jesus gathered his disciples in the upper room and said, this is my body that is for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This marred image was restored on the cross by the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ, the second Adam. Thank you.